Praise the Lord. So Mark chapter 11 is where we've been for the last six weeks now. This, has been, this is week number six, and we've been talking about uh, what do you do with mountain-sized problems in your life? And does anybody in here not have any? I mean, if you don't have any mountain-sized problems in your life, we should probably have already come to your funeral. Because <laughs> you if you don't have them, you're not here. <laughs> Life's full of them. Life is full of mountain-sized problems. Uh, and really, you know, uh, in this scripture that we're getting ready to read, Jesus dealt with a little bit of a smaller problem. It was just a, you know, a little fig tree-sized problem. And he had cursed the fig tree, and it died from the roots. And when they came back the next day, the disciples were all amazed. And they were like, wow, this tree that didn't have any fruit on it now is dead because you said nobody's going to eat fruit from it anymore. And, uh, and, and this is what Jesus answered them. And that's what we've been talking about here in verse 22. Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Now we said to you in the first week that faith is the most important aspect when it comes to being in the kingdom of God because everything that we do hinges on that. Now the greatest thing for you to walk in is love. And then one of the greatest things that you can have for your future is hope. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. But uh, the, the Bible talks about three things that affect the life of the believer, faith, hope, and love. Well, faith is something that's extremely important to you because the Bible says that's how we're supposed to please God. It's impossible to please God without faith. And that means this, all the good works that a lot of people do, that they're just kind of doing that they hope that it, they're doing the right thing, that's not pleasing to God. There's a lot of people that are going to get to heaven or, or they're going to stand before God one day and they're going to be disappointed because they're going to say, but we did this and we did that. And the Bible says that he's going to look at them and say, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. Why? Because they weren't doing it in faith. Listen, I'm all right with the talk show host buying everybody in the, in the audience a new car. That's great. But that doesn't please God unless you do it knowing God or believing God's leading you and you're, you're, okay. Now we're, oh, but man, that's a pretty awesome thing. To, it is. But listen, you can be as good a person as you want to be. You can be, you know, you can follow the golden rule and you can do all that. But if you're not in faith, you're not pleasing God at all. You're not. And some of you go, well, I, I mean, I don't really care if I please God or not. That's, I mean, my, my life stinks. Well, maybe you should try pleasing God with faith a little bit and move the mountains out of your life, and your life wouldn't stink so bad. I mean, a lot of people, they, they want to blame God, but they don't ever want to believe God. Let me just give you a little secret. If you don't believe God, and you're not believing on God, and you're not believing in God, None of the stuff's coming into your life is coming from God. None of it. If you're blaming God, yelling at God, and screaming at God, and being mad at God, you're blaming the wrong person because nothing in your life has come from him. Nothing. Yeah, it is good. And I'll amen myself. Stop blaming God. Listen, you're blaming the wrong person. If somebody walked up and punched you right now, and you turned around and punched the other person on the other side of you, whose fault is that? Wasn't theirs. It was that guy's. But a lot of, that's what a lot of us are doing. We think that God's just going to do any, anything and everything, and when he brings hard stuff into our lives and all this stuff, and it, we're blaming it all on him. And the fact of the matter is, if you don't believe on him, believe in him, Believe for him. None of the stuff in your life from him anyway. And you're deceived. You are deceived. 
So we said to you in week one, and I'm going to try and go through this fast, basically God's given, a, given us freely everything. But that doesn't mean that we have it in our lives. Whatever's been given freely by grace must be obtained or received by faith. Now I want you to catch that because that goes with what I'm saying. What has been given by grace must be obtained by faith. That means that whatever you're obtaining in your life, you're believing in something else. If you're, if you're obtaining or, or pulling bad things into your life, you're believing something else. This is not in my notes at all. This is good this morning. Somebody needs to get this. If you are obtaining bad in your life, that means your faith is in that, where, whatever that is. If it's the world, or if it's darkness, or if it's the devil, or whatever, that's where your faith is. That's why you're receiving it. That's why you're obtaining it. Everything that God gives must be obtained by faith. Listen to me. If I give you a million dollars, if, you got, if, if, if I gave you a million dollars, and you go, well, that would never happen. Okay, let's bring it down to rubber meat in the road. If I gave you a hundred dollars, because a lot of people have had that happen in their life. $100. If I gave you $100 and I laid it on a, on a chair and said, that's yours, and you never walked up and got the, got the $100, whose fault is that? Mine or yours? Well, you walking up and picking it up and putting it in your pocket, that's what faith does with the promises and the blessings that the Bible talks about. If you don't believe for them, they are never going to show up. Ever. You may get a lucky blessing every now and then. You may get a, a merciful blessing every now and then. And sadly, this is where most of the body of Christ lives. In the spillover. But see, in order for us to live in the abundant land of blessing... And, the, and really enjoy the promises and the blessings of God, we have to believe what God has to say. And so you can't just, just because you've been given something freely, you have to still obtain it. You have to go and receive it. All right? So we said to you, faith is what we live by, what we walk by, what we quench the fiery darts of the devil by, and of course, what we move mountains by and we came up with this definition that faith is a strong opinion based on the word of god now there's two different kinds of faith there's natural human faith or we like to call it thomas's version of faith because those those are the people that only believe it when they see it well that's not faith that's just knowledge but it's okay to walk some of your life out in that like I said to you last week, if you step off the sidewalk and you see a car coming, you better believe that car's coming. And it's just not going to pass through you. <laughs> if not, we're going to your funeral. You know? <laughs> there are a lot of things that you don't need, you know, you don't need to go and consult the Word of God on because we have eyes. <laughs> when you get up in the morning and there are no sky, there are no clouds in the sky, and it's blue. You don't need God to tell you um, that it's going to be a dry day today. Now you go, well, we live in Florida. By 3 o'clock, that changes. That's true. <laughs> but in the morning, you get up and there's no clouds in the sky. Guess what? You don't have to go, God, is it going to, is it, is it, is it, is it uh, dry outside right now? No, it's obvious. That, but that's natural human faith, and there's a lot of times that we can live by that. You know, I spent the day at Disney World yesterday. I knew sometime around 2 or 3 o'clock, God didn't tell me, didn't give me a leading, didn't read it in the Bible, that it was going to rain. So you know what I did? I, didn't, I wasn't stupid and went to the gift shop at Disney World and paid $17 for a poncho. I went to one of those cheesy gift shops outside the gates and paid $3 for it. Come on, somebody. Paid $3 for a poncho and carried it around all day for 30 minutes of cloud-bursting rain yesterday. But guess what? I didn't leave the park. Watched all these other people walking around miserable the rest of the day, drenched. Or people leaving because they couldn't stand to be in the rain. 
I used my natural, come on, watch this, my natural human faith to tell, oh, it's going to rain. I didn't need God to tell me that. But now here's where the other kind of faith comes in. When your natural human faith runs into something that's contrary to the Word of God, then you have to switch over to the other kind of faith, which is Abraham's faith that says, I don't care what it looks like. This is contrary to what God's Word says. This is contrasting to what God's Word says. What does this mean? This is different than the way God set things up. And if it's different from the way God set things up, then that means I need to believe what God's Word says more than what I'm seeing. That's why, come on, we walk by faith and not by sight. Okay? Now listen to me. When you wake up in the morning and a symptom is in your body, let me tell you what that is. That is contrary or contrast, come on somebody, to what God's Word says about your body. Well, what does God's word say about my body? Well, first of all, it says that he created it and it was good. And some of you go, dang right. It was good. <laughs> but now, now listen, it, first of all, it says he created it and it was good. Secondly, it says this, by his stripes ye were, past tense, healed. So that means if you wake up in the morning and you have a symptom in your body, now if you want to naturally believe that with your natural human faith, you can accept it and you'll have that sickness or disease or whatever for the rest of your life. But now this is where the other kind of faith comes in. If you go like Abraham and say, I'm 100 years old, but God said I could have a baby, after you get past the fact that you probably want to throw up, that's disgusting. <laughs> After you move past that, now if, you, if, if, if Abraham chooses to not believe that, guess what him and Sarah would have been? Childless till they died. And they would have went on to heaven with no children. Now does that mean God's a liar? Or does that mean Abraham just didn't believe it? It's the latter, just in case you're wondering. See, when you wake up and you have something going on in your body that is contrasting to what God's Word says about your body, you can now choose, listen to me, to believe God's Word more than what your body's telling you. Well, just because I believe it doesn't make it so. True, that's what we've been talking about. But that's the first step. You have to make a decision to believe or have an opinion based on the Word of God. This goes with addictions. Come on, somebody. This well, it didn't get nobody. This goes with addictions, too. I'm craving a drink. I'm craving a hit. Come on, somebody. I'm craving pornography. Pastor, you're making me nervous. I'm craving whatever. Listen, that's your body's natural human faith telling you something. You can choose to believe something else. Yeah, but the doctor said. Is this, is this all right? But the doctor is an expert, and he went to this university, and he got this degree, and he's been practicing for this many years, and he's done this, and he's done that. Does, did he create the world? Did he create the universe? Did he create your body? The doctor created your body? Are you a test tube baby? Are you an experiment? That explains a whole lot, doesn't it? The doctor didn't do any of that. So you can tell me all kind of experts, things that you want. They still don't know how everything works. But I know somebody does. Yeah, but. Yeah, that's the whole point. I can go on believing the natural human side of things, or I can choose to believe something different. I can choose to believe what God's Word says. Listen, that's what Abraham's faith does. The Bible says Abraham did not take into account his own body and Sarah's body being well past the age of childbearing. They didn't take into any account of that. What does that mean? They ignored what the experts said. They ignored what the pundits said. 
They ignored what their favorite author told them. Come on, somebody. They, have, they ignored their favorite television show who tells them certain things and that they build their whole life by. They ignored it. Well, they didn't have television in the good old days of the Bible, Pastor. You understand what I'm saying. <laughs> they, they ignored it. They said, you know what? I am 100 years old, and ain't nobody had no children at 100 years old, but you know what? God said this, so we're going to believe it anyway. That's Abraham-type faith. So now, um, let, me, let, me, uh, let me read you this little thing here. The, uh, Oswald Chambers says this, the, the words of God and the word of God stand together. To separate them is to render both powerless. Now catch that. What's the difference in the word of God and the words of God? Well, the word of God is your Bible. It's written down. We know what it says. God will also lead you by your spirit with a word for you. You have to kind of, you know, ascertain from the spirit because there's some things the Bible doesn't specifically cover. Okay? And so there's some things that he needs to speak to you specifically. But now you can't separate that from the Bible. Well, there's something, I thought you just said the Bible doesn't cover everything. It doesn't cover everything, but the principle is in the Bible. God will always lead you back to agree with what the Bible says. So if you separate the two and you go, well, what I'm believing for isn't found in the Bible. You just rendered what you think you heard powerless and the Bible powerless in your life. It's powerless. Powerless in your life. To separate them renders both powerless in your life. Any expounder of the words of God is liable to go off on a tangent if he or she does not remember the stern, undeviating standard, namely, no individual experience is a, it has any remote value unless it lines up to the standard of the word of God. The Bible not only tests experience, it tests truth. The Bible tests all experience, all truth, all authority by our Lord himself in our relationship to him personally. That's Oswald Chambers. Now here's what I'm trying to say. Before you can believe God, you have to know what God has to say, so that means it has to be based on, come on, God's word. So you need to put a fresh coat of, of the word on your faith before you use it because faith has to be based on the word. All right. Then we gave you some steps about how to build strong faith. You can go back and li listen to those. Um, but then here's where we got to. We, we're, 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 we've really been camping for the last two weeks. Faith has to be released. See, once I believe something, that doesn't just settle it. Just because I believe something doesn't mean anything. Until I release what I believe, it is not going to do me any good. There are plenty of things that you believe right now that aren't serving any purpose in your life. You just believe it. Just a good comfort area for you, and that's about it. But it doesn't do anything. What are we trying to say? If faith is an opinion, a strong opinion based on the Word of God, how many of you know an opinion is worthless unless you give it to somebody? Then they have to decide what they're going to do with it, right? Okay, if I have an opinion about what God's word says, it doesn't do me any good until I start speaking it out. Until I start giving it out. So faith has to be released. It must be put out. All right? Uh, I said to you that Mark eleven twenty three 23 has the word say in it three times. The word believe once. And Brother Hagin used to say this, saying is three times more important than believing. Last week we talked about what do we need to be saying. Well, once you know what God has to say about your mountain, you need to, we said to you last week, express or speak or release your faith in the fact that you have authority that Jesus gives you over those problems. You can't command something and expect it to obey you if you don't have authority over it. All right. Um, 
If somebody gives you authority over something, that means they are giving you all of their power in order to back that up. And remember I said to you, a policeman can't no more walk outside and physically stop a car from driving down the road, but his little shiny badge and his gloved hand and a whistle going up like this, people stop. Why? Well, because all of the power of the city of Orlando, the state of Florida, and the United States of America back him up. And if somebody runs him over, what's going to happen? We have now a manhunt on our hands. And what happens? Every sheriff and every police department will start there. And if it get, keeps going and it's worse, they'll go get, come on, the, the state National Guard. And if it, that's, it comes down to it, the Army will come march in the Marines and the Air Force and the Navy. They will back all the way up if they had to. And how many of you know they possess the power to stop a car from driving down the road? <laughs> not just the authority. They can make sure your car's not going nowhere. I mean, all they have to do is just aim a big tank right at it and <laughs> pull the trigger, and your car's going nowhere, right? Hello? Yeah, Adrian's shaking his head. Uh, Mr. Marine is shaking his head. He knows what that's like. It's not just authority. It's power. This is why Jesus gave to us. All right? He gave us the authority to use the power in his name. If Jesus walked up and said, you know, just waved his hand over you and said, rise and be healed, or rise and be delivered, or rise and be set free, uh, <laughs> it just happened. Y'all know he did miracles too, right? I mean, he walked up to the mouth of the tomb where, <laughs> where Lazarus was at, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And it didn't, it didn't, well, I don't know if I believe I can come forth, God. Nope, the Bible says he would just start hopping out of the tomb. Why? Because the power is there. All right? The power is there. Okay, so when you speak using the authority he gives you, then God's power goes into operation to cause or force or make what you spoke happen. All right? And I said to you, and a lot of people looked at me funny when I said this, it's as though Jesus himself was standing there speaking to your mountain. Now, people, people had a problem with that. And I decided I'm going to camp out here this week, and we're going to hammer this home. Because you, some of you just looked at me like, there's no way. Uh, I mean, when I speak something out, yeah, if you speak it out on your own, your problems aren't going to listen to you, and they're going to laugh back in your face and be like, okay, whatever. But when you speak with the authority Jesus gives you, it's as though he was speaking to it. And some of you are having a problem with that because you don't see yourself being in Christ Jesus. And you don't understand how this whole thing works. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Your authority to speak to your mountain has been given to you because of the power of Jesus' name. All right? Now... Let me read you this. This is from a man named Ole Halsby. He says this, prayer or faith, it is when the risen Jesus comes in with his resurrection power, given free reign in our lives, and then uses his authority to enter any situation and change it. Now, I want you to notice how much he talked about Jesus there. Now, a lot of times, word of faith people get way off base on this because they start thinking that it's them because they're a new creature. It is, but you have to understand, you don't have any power to do this. I hate to burst some of your bubbles, but you don't. He does, and he lives in you. Come on, somebody. He lives in you. Okay? Colossians chapter 2, verse number 15. This says this, talking about Jesus, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Now you go, what in the world does that mean? Well, listen to this. Those principalities and powers, that's what's dogging your life right now. That's what's beating you up. Come on, that's what's holding you back. Ain't a person. It's not a person. It's not a sickness. Come on, it's not poverty. It's not any other name you want to name. 
It's not. It is a principality and a power. What is that? It is a power of darkness. That's what it is. And it says here, and notice all of this, put that scripture back up there. All of this is in past tense. This is not something that's supposed to happen. This is something that already did happen. Having disarmed. <laughs> Y'all learned that, right, when you were in school? Ed? <laughs> Ed means past tense. Having disarmed. That's the way my fifth grader says it. Armed. He's, he's in fifth grade now. Armed. Having disarmed. What are we doing? We're calling attention to the fact that this already, come on, happened. Yes. Having disarmed principalities and powers. Anything you're facing, listen to me, it's already been defeated. Well, why is it showing up in my life? Because you believe it woo, more than you believe what God said. No, it's because so-and-so is doing this to me, and this is the way society is, and this is the way life is, and this is the way. That's your natural human faith, believing that more than you believe what God said. You're going to tell me that doesn't affect you? That's exactly what I'm saying. Well, that's awful arrogant. No, it's not. It's believing what God said, because it's not. Listen to me, and if you think that's arrogance, here's why. You're thinking I'm saying it's me. Catch, the, catch this. I'm not saying it's me. I'm saying the reason it doesn't affect me is because of what Jesus did for me. And I choose to believe that more than I believe what everybody else is going through. And Listen, David could say things like, a thousand will fall at one side and ten thousand will fall at the other side, but it will not come near me. Well, who do you think you are? I don't think I'm anything. But he's everything, and he's living in me. This is good. You should be catching this. Having disarmed, already done, principalities and powers. Every bad thing you're going to face, mountains. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Now, this doesn't really make a lot of sense to us because we don't know our history. But in the good old days of the Roman Empire, when they would roll in and defeat a whole other kingdom, they would drag the king out, all of his generals, the senate, everything else that was there in their government, and they would put them on the side of a, of a chariot, strip them all the way down to nakedness, and strap them up there where they just they can't be seen. I mean, they can't be hidden. Nothing can be hidden. Everything's out in the open. No swords, no official dress, no weapons. They're just hanging out there for the whole world to see. And they would drive them on the side of the chariots right past Caesar. And they'd be like, look what, you, look what we've done for you, Caesar. This is this mighty king of so-and-so, and he's now defeated. And look, he doesn't have anything now. That's what they're talking about here. That's what Paul is using this illustration. He's saying he's disarmed them, took everything he had from him. Who? The, princi oh, the principalities and powers that you're facing. Come on, the bad things that are coming against your life. He disarmed them. He disarmed them. Okay? He made a public spectacle. What does that mean? For in front of all of creation, Jesus stripped Satan of his power and then showed it him off to all of creation and said, look, I took everything away from him. Made a public spectacle of him. And, then he, and when he did that, he was announcing his triumph, my, his victory. Well, guess what that is? That belongs to you now. That belongs to you now. I'll preach to myself in the reflection here. That belongs to you, good looking, right there. You do. It belongs to you. <laughs> it belongs to you now. Amen. This is where people have a hard time with this. If it really belongs to me, why am I facing it? You have to believe it. There's a, a marginal note in a lot, of the, a lot of Bibles. It says this. He put off from himself the principalities and powers. Now what does that mean? He put off him he put off from himself. When Jesus died, 
You have to understand Jesus only died because he chose to die. He chose to. He allowed death to take him. He allowed himself to be killed. He actually said these words. He said, don't you think I could call 10,000 angels to come and wipe out this entire thing? Now listen to me. There's a few times in the Bible where we see what angels can really do. I mean, we all hear about the, you know, when they come and they stand and they go, fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings. We know those stories. And we go, Mary, blessed are thee amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, thy holy child Jesus. I am Gabriel. We know those stories. But there are only a few, I mean, you know, we, we, we hear about messengers, messenger angels. But there is a few times in the Bible where we actually can see what the angels really did. Well, there's one place where one guy wiped out, one angel wiped out 100,000 men by himself. One. 100,000 men. Gone. Two of them came to Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed a whole city. Two. Two. Now, I want you to catch this. If Jesus called 10,000 angels... What is he saying? I could wipe out this entire thing if I want to. And all of you would be a greasy spot in the universe. Just a right. bug on the windshield. If I wanted that, bye. See ya. But he didn't do any of that. Why? Because he allowed himself to be taken. But now what death did not know when it took him was even though it was allowed by Jesus, it wasn't allowed by the law of sin and death. Now let me explain that. The law of sin and death is this. When Jesus said to Adam and Eve, you eat this tree, you will die. What is he saying? You, do what I, you go against what I'm telling you, what I've originally created you to do and live forever, you won't. You will die. Did they listen? Nope. I know more than God. Clunk. And we've been blaming God ever since when it was whose fault? Ours. Come on, somebody. Ours. All right. Jesus never sinned. Catch this. Jesus sta never sinned. So he was actually standing and living the way God originally intended for all of us to live. What are you saying? If he didn't allow them to kill him, he would have kept on living physically. Now see, we all know he's alive in heaven right now. Many of you say he's living in my heart right now. True. But I'm talking about the physical body of Jesus would still be alive here on the earth right now if he didn't allow death to take him. All right? Does everybody understand that? Now, it was in that arrogance that Satan and death made the biggest mistake ever because he said, okay, take me. They were like, yes, once we have him, he ain't coming back. This is over. And so they took him, all right, and they took him to hell. The Bible says that he went to hell. He's there in hell under their control. Why didn't it stay? People go, well, God's just all powerful. Well, that's true. But he's not legally allowed to just do whatever he wants to do. I mean, he is. If he really wanted to, God could wipe it all out and we would never know the difference. But legally, because God is just, come on, and does everything the way there's no back doors, no loopholes to get out of it, he had to legally do it this way. Jesus allowed him to take him. He's in hell. And God says this, hey, he never sinned. You've taken him unjustly. Yeah, but he said I could. 
you should know the law. You're not allowed to, come on somebody, you're not allowed to do that. So therefore, you stepped out of what you've been allowed to do, and you can't do that. <laughs> so when Jesus, come on, Jesus is there, he is now legally forced to give up control. Satan is legally forced to give up what control he has back to Jesus. Come on, somebody. Has to. It's, le it's illegally, it's, that's the way it is. Because, now listen, people say, well, he tricked Adam and Eve, and, and that's how he got control. Yep. And they were stupid enough to believe him more than they believed God. Yeah. <laughs> what happens? That's what happens when we, we stop believing God. Anything comes in our life, that's us, on us. All right? So he believe, they believed something else, and they gave control legally to Satan. Well, God's like, okay, you just did what you did to them, so we'll just be taking control back now. That should be getting a whole lot more excitement from you than that. In his arrogance, Satan and death made the fatal error of illegally trying to hold Jesus in hell. All right? Let me break it down to you like this. Has anybody, anybody ever seen, I mean, my kids take Taekwondo. You ever seen them, like, they put each other in these holds and headlocks and, you know, arm bars, and, and they're trying to, and what they're, they're putting them in it so the instructor can, can show them how to get out of it. And usually the instructor does it first. Okay, put my arm behind my back. And he puts his arm behind his back. And he goes, now, if this ever happens to you, here's what you do. And he drops his leg and makes like two or three flips. And the next thing you know, the guy had his arms laying on the ground. And he's standing there free. This is what Jesus did. Right. He's like, okay, you can take me. Right. You got me. And he does like one, two little moves. Boom, Satan's laying on the ground. Yes. Okay, now check this out. Satan's the martial arts instructor. I mean, Satan is the, is, Jesus is the martial arts instructor. Satan's the guy that, you know, is his little assistant showing him how to do this. Now, I've sat and watched Master Schultz with my kids. That's who, that's who our, our, uh, our sensei is. And, uh, and he always walks it through him first, then he walks it through him with them. He shows them how to do it, then he does it with them, then he sits there and watches them do it. Now listen to me. Jesus, listen to me. Jesus already did it. He already flipped the devil back over and broke the armbar and he's laying there. All right? Now he's trying to show you how to do it. Now is it because you're so good and you're so awesome? No, it's because he knows where his, where his power is. Come on. And he's trying to show you how to use that power. It isn't because... You're such a good student, and you earn it, and I'm just so freaking awesome. It's not that. It's not. It's because he's so good, and he's so awesome, and he knows everything. And he knows how it legally works. Jesus allowed himself to be put in a hold knowing how to break it. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 14 says this. Because God's children are human beings made out of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he, look at these next words, break, break, Break the power of the devil who had, notice that big H-A-D is past tense, had, had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all, you're still not getting it, all, all who had lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. What's he saying? I came, allowed myself to be put in this hold that I knew I knew, already knew how to break, 
The call came from the throne of God that Jesus had been killed unjustly, and by doing so, Satan was then overthrown. Now, because of the name of who he is, the name of Jesus, and somebody ought to be shouting by now, because of that name, when you are born again and you are placed in him, you now have the same authority to use that name. Well, what authority is that? All of it. He has been given all authority. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 9. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and, on, and under the earth, and every t tongue shall declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <laughs> In all the time that Jesus died, resurrected, ascended, and sat down next to the Father, listen to this, he has never used his name once. It's not like he was walking around going, um, in the name of me, come out of him. Uh, in the name of me, be healed. He doesn't do that, does he? What does he do? Be healed. Come out of him. Go look at how he did it when he was walking. Your faith has made you whole. Not in the name of me. So what's the name of Jesus for if it's not for him? It's for us. It's for us. When Jesus speaks, he just speaks. But the name of Jesus is given to all those who follow him. Yes. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 22. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things. For what? For the benefits. <clears throat> Somebody please grab this. For the benefit of just whoever I feel like being nice to today. For the benefit of you, because you're a preacher. For the benefit of that saintly person in church here who seems to read the Bible and, you know, just, oh, they got it all together. No, no. For the benefit of the church. Who's the church? Come on, who is the church? We are. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fits all things everywhere with himself. Now catch this. All that Jesus is and all that Jesus has done can be found in his name. Listen, when somebody says Jesus, there's a few things that pop into their head. They think, you know, white robe, blue sash, long hair. Most of us raised in America think English accent. <laughs> Behold, I give you power to... I mean, that's what we think of, right? Don't lie. Every, listen, if you grew up in the 70s and the 80s, everybody you said Jesus, you thought Jesus of Nazareth, period. That's the movie you thought of. You thought of it. That's the first thing you think of. Those of you now, you say Jesus, you think Jim Caviezel. <laughs> That's the only person I've ever seen speak with an English accent while speaking Armenian. <laughs> Go back and watch The Passion. He's speaking Aramean, not Armenian, Ar Aramean, Aramean with an English accent. Ar whatever. Don't correct. I'm going to correct you when you get a lyric wrong. All right. <laughs> He's speaking it with an English accent. Y'all know Jesus wasn't British, right? All right. Just, just saying. All right. But most people, when they say Jesus, that there's the physical image that we have of him. But then you start thinking about the cross and the blood. Less people. When you say Jesus, think about him walking out of the tomb because it's, it's ingrained in our, in our minds the image of him on the cross. But see, it didn't end there. Come on, somebody. It didn't end there. 
it went on, he went to hell, and he came out of the grave victorious, which is why we celebrate Easter, all right? When he walked out of the grave victorious, okay, everything that he had just done got capsulized in that name. So when you say Jesus, you're, thinking, you're speaking about the man, you're speaking about the death, Come on, but you're also speaking about the resurrection. All of it's all encapsulated in that name. When you say Jesus, that's what it means, all right? Okay? Everything he did, everything he is, is now in his name. And that name, oh, hallelujah, belongs to those who accept him as Lord. God invested that into us, and we have a right to use that name for every need we have john chapter 16 verse 23 and in that day what day we talking about well it's now he was talking about future tense here but this this day is now in that day you will ask me nothing more most assuredly what's he talking about jesus aren't we supposed to ask you no he's telling you you're not going to ask me you're not going to ask me anything That just rocked some of you right there. Well, I've been praying to Jesus all this time. Maybe that's why your prayer didn't get answered. You ain't supposed to pray to Jesus. Put your rocks down. Everybody stop panicking. <laughs> You're not supposed to pray to Jesus. Oh, I'm nervous. That's why your prayer's not getting answered. Listen to what it says. In that day, now, you shall ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father, just the Father? Nope. Whatever you ask the Father in my name. What does that mean? You're asking him, and you, you're saying in the name of Jesus. What does that mean? You're asking because I came, I died, whoa, I rose again. Now you're able to ask him anything. That went right over and hit that corner over there. Because Jesus came, because Jesus died, because Jesus rose again, you're able to now approach the Father. Let me tell you something. Before that, you weren't allowed to. If you did, it was merciful. Oh, God, help! And that was about it. And you, could, you were crossing your fingers and I uh, hope he hears me and maybe he will. But because of what Jesus did, now you can expect God to listen to you. Whatever, oh, catch it, whatever you ask the Father in my name, now somebody ought to shout over these next three, four words, he, hallelujah, will give you. Now he's telling them up until now, verse 24, until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive. Why? Just so we can just say, well, because God's so good. No, that's not what it says here. Ask, and you, wish you will receive, and you will have abundant joy. The other translation says this, that your joy may be full. What's, what, what are you talking about? He wants to bless you. When you ask in his name, he wants to bless you. Why? Just so people go, well, I mean, I want stuff to happen just so that God can be glorified. Well, great. Then stop walking around with your bottom lip hanging on the ground. Because that's not glorifying God. No. But if your joy is full, come on, somebody, and you look like somebody that's blessed, oh, and you act like somebody that's blessed, come on, somebody, and you walk like somebody that's blessed, and you live like somebody that's blessed, and you quench fiery darts like somebody that's blessed, and you move mountains, bless God like somebody is blessed, what happens? Your joy's full. And God gets the glory. <laughs> In that day is now. We're living in the day where you can ask Jesus, you can't ask Jesus directly because Jesus isn't here. He tells us to ask the Father in his name. Now, if you're taking notes, you should write this down and make this huge right here. The name of Jesus takes the place of Jesus, 
personally. Now, what's that mean? He's not here anymore. So when you speak in his name, it takes the place of Jesus personally in performing miracles, delivering from Satan's authority, and bringing God on the scene. I'll say it again. The name of Jesus takes the place of Jesus personally in performing miracles, delivering from Satan's authority, and bringing God on the scene. Now listen, nobody would have a problem if he came walking in here right now receiving everything you'd have in your life that you need. Every mountain would crumble. Come on. Every symptom would disappear. Your bank account would fill up. Come on, somebody. Your investments would go further. I mean, every, you, you'd be happy. Come on, he'd just <clears throat> wave his hand and it would be gone. Right. Speak over you and it happened. Most people don't understand that his name has that same power as his body. His name has the same power that him as the person had. It's the same. I'm not going to stop till you get it. His name has the same power that his person had. Same. It's the exact same. Okay? Here's more. Take this. Write this down. When we use the name of Jesus according to what God said, it's as though Jesus were here himself speaking it. This is deep, I know. You need to catch it. This is why I'm camping here this week, and I didn't move on to what I had. Okay? When we use the name of Jesus according to what God has said, it's as though Jesus were here himself speaking it. Why? Because that name is the person, come on, is his death, come on, and is the resurrection. And all of that is encapsulated in his name. So when I pray or I speak to this mountain, come on, or I try to live for God, or, 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 or I try to walk, or I try to quench a fiery dart for the devil, or whatever, if I do that in the name of Jesus... It's as though Jesus is standing here living my life for me. So that means if he can walk up to a mountain and be like, get out of my way. If he can walk up to a fig tree and be like, let no one ever eat fruit of you again, and it dies. Then I can do it in his name. I can go up to it and be like, mountain, move. Yeah, but it just feels like it's such a big deal. See, you're believing what that's telling you more than what God's words. I just gave you like 20 scriptures backing up what I'm saying. Now, you have to decide whether you believe that or not. And if you don't, if you go, well, you know what, Pastor? I just have a hard time believing that. Well, go ahead and keep living that defeated life you're living. I'm trying to help you. I'm laying the million dollars on the desk. Here it is. You have to decide to use that. R.C. Sproul says this, the very word authority has within it the word author. Some of you are going, does it? (laughs) An author is someone who creates and possesses a particular work. Insofar as God is the foundation of all authority, He exercises that foundation because he is the author and the owner of all creation. He is the foundation upon which all other authority stands or falls. Now listen to me. When you go speak into your mountain some crazy thing that you just made up on your own and you don't have any idea what you're talking about and it doesn't line up with the Word of God and you go, but I thought I was doing it right. That's why it's not working. You're not doing it right. And you don't have the power to make it happen. You can beam thoughts towards it and ask everybody on Facebook, send happy thoughts my way. (laughs) Ain't going to help you at all. Might comfort you a little bit knowing that other people are going, we're with you. But it's not going to change anything. You can get mad. 
yell at everybody around you, tell them it's all they're no good, and that they, you can blame it on everybody else, it isn't going to change anything. <laughs> you, can, you can go and, and, and you can work your fingers to the bone till all you have is bone sticking out and, and you've got all your calluses are gone and, you're, and you can work yourself to a frenzy and to the point of mental exhaustion and it's not going to help you at all. It has to be, come on, based on what God's word says and when you speak to it in the name of Jesus, you have to understand it's not just your voice going out physically and hitting the, the roof and coming back and smacking you in the face. When you speak in the name of Jesus, it's just like Jesus stands up in heaven in the spirit world and goes, hey, mountain. Uh -huh, exactly. <laughs> that is why your mountain has to move. It's who you are in Christ, because of Christ, who Jesus is living on the inside of you. It's the guy who has, come on, already defeated principalities and powers. And he's living on the inside of you. And he's given, that's how good people have a hard time wrapping their minds around the fact that God's this good. God is so good. He knows that we're imperfect. And he knows that we're stupid. And he knows that we make mistakes. And he knows that we screw up. And he goes, it's okay. You can still use my name. And I'll still move your mountain. <laughs> Apply my word to your life and it will change. <laughs> It's all about him. It's all about who he is. It's all about who he is living in you. Now, I didn't get as far as I wanted to today because I kept having to go off book. Somebody in here was pulling it out on me. Good job. I don't know who you were, but you got something today that you needed. I had three more points to make, and we didn't even get to them, but we just pick up there next week. I told you we was going to take our time. Because the moment, the moment you really, the light bulbs start to come on in some of your lives, the moment the light bulb comes on full blast, man, you're going to be amazed at how much God moves in your life. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Lord, thank you.